the line right now. Check, mic check. There are no mics in here. Mike is teaching Sunday school today. Feedback loop. It's <laughs> great. All right, I'm gonna close that over. Oh, boy, I'm getting me too. All right, we'll stop all that. Cool. Well, welcome everybody who's watching on the internet. Um, yeah, so we have a new internet setup, which was temperamental during the church service today, but seems to be working fine for Bible study. So we'll try it out, see how it goes. Um, yeah. So today we are continuing our look at, at, at paganism, uh, not so hidden hidden paganism in American Christian America again, in America today. Um, and we're going to continue on from last week and talk about what I think superstitions today. That'll be a lot of fun um, going through that. So let's open up with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for this chance to to get together to study your word. Um, to learn about how to be a faithful witness to the resurrection here in the United States. Uh, bless us in our time this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. So. Tangent. Yes, tangent. Before I forget. Yep. I need a message for the upcoming newsletter. Oh, yeah. Um, Send an email. Don't forget. <laughs> I'll probably forget with an email, but we'll get it done. <laughs> Oh, email text you, call you. Yeah, smoke signals, carrier pigeons. I'll send the dog over with a message. Your dog? My dog. Send him over with a little message on his back. <laughs> Take him a while, he's got little legs. Anyway, so yeah, um, we're going to continue on from last week. So last week, if you were here with us, we talked about these things. And we ended up talking, at, we ended our, our time last week looking at this, this practice of New Age um, and, and New Ageism. We talked about psychics and that kind of thing. Um, and so there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of New Age stuff going on in the world right now, um, specifically in the United States. New Age is, is like the second most popular unofficial origin, according to my experience in the world. Uh, there's a lot of. Um, a lot of unsavory practices that get blended together um, that people sometimes think are innocuous but are actually pagan practices. Um, practices such as, as healing crystals. Um, and if you're unfamiliar, healing crystals are you go out and you buy this, this piece of quartz and you put, rub this piece of quartz against your arm, your arm hurts, and then that'll make you feel better. Um, or if you strategically place these pieces of quartz, that's usually quartz, almost always quartz, um, around your house, it'll align with the energy of the earth and create this, this um, field of healing that you can have inside your home. I have two at home. Are they aligned properly? No, they're Good. just hanging <laughs> on the wall. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one thing to hang a pretty rock. It's another thing to say that this is, creates this healing zone in my house. Um, there's also um, this, this practice of auras. Um, do you know what an aura is? Kind of like an energy that surrounds you, supposedly. Yeah. I like to think of an aura as like the, uh, you ever seen like a Renaissance painting with the halos? Yeah. Yeah, like that. Only everybody has one. And they have this, these, these different auras going around. Um, and that if you're experiencing problems, um, it needs to, it's, it shows in your aura, and you can correct the aura to correct the physical problem. 
that's another example of it. Then there's what's practiced called Reiki. Uh, Reiki uh, is, is commonly called smudging. Um, like with sage? Yeah, with sage. Are you familiar with, with that at all? I, not at all, no. It's I, not something I do, no. No, Good. no. I, I, it's something that I watched on TV. Sure. Watching. Like Supernatural? Yeah. Yeah. Supernaturalist. <laughs> A good blending of everything weird. No, I don't watch the Supernatural. I, wa I, I used to watch Haunted. Haunted, yeah. Um, because there's not, a show called Supernatural. Not because I believe yeah, yeah, yeah. in spirits, but you know, it's just an interesting, an interesting show. show. It was like the X Files. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, some of them were kind of scary, but you know, like well, it's just a program. But they did have in a few episodes where they would burn sage sure. around the house. Yeah. To try to rid spirits. Yeah. Let's not do that. Um, I smell nice. I don't know. I've never burned sage. <laughs> it's not, I burned food with sage in it. <laughs> uh, then there's, uh, there's chakras. Uh, chakras are like energy wells. This gets back to what I had the aura thing. So you have like seven chakras inside of you. And then if you align your chakras, you'll be a good flow of energy. I think they call it chi. And then that, that, that makes you more receptive to the universe. And so if you're experiencing some kind of angst in your life, like um, relationship angst or employment angst or something like that, or you're embarrassed by that one thing you did back in junior high that you shouldn't have done that still haunts you to this day all these years later, then if you're able to, if you're able to align your chakras, you can get rid of all of that negativity kind of thing um, and be more open to the universe. All, all, all the New Age practices, so New Ageism, um, really took off in like the late 80s, early 90s, and there were like new age gatherings that you could go and be a part of, like official, like new age church kind of stuff. Who um, invented this? I have it written down somewhere. I've got a whole book on it, um, which is outdated now because it talks about how you can go and get these things on video cassette. And I just made it. <laughs> But there's uh, this, 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 this new agey thing. Uh, it seems to be, as far as people who study these things can tell, just a blending of like Native American spiritualism with Eastern religions, throwing it together into this one kind of melting pot. Um, in new age, there's this, this impersonal force, kind of like in Star Wars. Uh, and and some, some scholars will use Star Wars as an example to describe what new age is. It's the force only a real life version of the force. And you gotta tap into it. And there's lots of different ways that you can tap into the force, such as putting those crystals up around your house, or doing the healing auras, or getting the chakras right, or whatever else. Um, it's just become this kind of, and so and that's, yeah, it's a new way to become this kind of American generalized spiritual melting pot. It's like the United States is the great melting pot, new ageism is the great melting pot of spirituality. Um, in the United States. Uh, New Ageism even has, has karma um, thrown into it, and karma gets thrown around a lot, um, especially on the internet. Um, the phrase instant karma. What uh, is karma? Yeah, the official karma or like American karma? Both. Both, perfect. So official karma comes out of, out of Hinduism. Um, and karma is just, um, it's how you achieve enlightenment. And so in the, in the caste system, there's different levels of holiness. Uh, Mother Teresa was famous for going to India and working with those who were the, the untouchables, mm -hmm. as they were called. Um, and then you work your way up the chain, and then eventually you reach enlightenment. Karma is, is uh, weighed at the end of your life. And it's the, the basis of all of your good things, your pious and holy things, versus all of your not pious and not holy things, kind of like on a big cosmic scale, and weighs it out. And if you have good karma at the end of your life, you'll move up when you're reincarnated. If you have bad karma, you move down um, if you're reincarnated. Uh, and so it's, uh, karma is the process through reincarnation by which you attain enlightenment. And so you strive to have good karma, to do more good things than bad things. So they, and that's just not like, good or bad things, but holier things, do more piousy things, spiritually things. Sounds Catholic. 
If you do enough of those things, you move up on the step. You keep moving up. Otherwise, you keep moving down. And so one of the reasons why the untouchables were untouchables is because what did they do? Get put on that low list. They must have been horrible people. And it's just that, that kind of system. They had bad karma. I think that only thing is in the four. Yeah, yeah, that's how we would see it. Absolutely. Um, and so karma and reincarnation go hand in hand. Now, in the United States, karma has adapted, has just changed um, to be oversimplified, kind of dumbed down, and just in everyday life. But the phrase instant karma has become popular. That's like so you see somebody zoom past you on the freeway going 195 miles an hour, and then they pass a speed trap and they get caught. They're like, aha, instant karma. Um, or somebody, um, what's the word? Somebody you know, makes a bold proclamation that everything's going to work perfectly and then it fails immediately, right? Instant karma, that kind of thing. Um, and it's, it's, again, it's this idea of you get what you deserve, you get what's coming. Um, what goes around comes around. Yeah, yeah, that kind of, that kind of thing. Um, but New Age, takes, New Age takes karma and makes it more formalized. Um, and those who adhere to actual New Ageism believe in karma, and they try to um, look to come back reincarnated as, as a better version, more spiritual, more holy, with the ultimate goal then of eventually sort of transcending, leaving the body, just becoming energy, being one with the universe kind of thing. So those practices are quite popular actually in the United States. A lot of, a lot of people practice them. Um, reincarnation is becoming increasingly popular um, with, with just Americans in general, the idea that you know, um, once we reject God, that life doesn't end. Life is just a bunch of big cycles. And so if you got it wrong in the cycle this time, you can come back and get it in the cycle next time that kind of thing. Um, yeah. The Hindu believe that though, don't they? I do. You know, that you can come back in a different form? Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, so have you, have you heard about karma or reincarnation before? That kind of thing. I, I've heard of it before. I can't say I know much about it. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, it's popular on TV too. Uh, one of my, my favorite television shows, Parks and Rec, uh, with, with Ron Swanson as a character. They have a, a scene, in, uh, a whole episode dedicated to uh, reincarnation. Um, well, I mean, in that case, you could put South Park and keep coming back. <laughs> <laughs> too funny. Um, yeah, and so it, again, it's this, it's this sense of trying to align yourself with the universal energy. Um, the phrase that, that always gets me the most is send good vibes. Mm -hmm. You've heard that one. Um, just thoughts and prayers has become trite and people belittle that a lot. Thoughts don't do any good. Prayers do good. But then it became, so then it becomes, you know, send me your good vibes. What does that mean? Again, it's an idea of this positive energy trying to connect yourself with the energy of the universe, align yourself in the right way, have all of these these things sent in. It, it sounds almost like people are afraid to get too religious by asking for just prayers. Yeah, maybe. You know, so they'll ask for thoughts and prayers or good vibes because I don't want to get too religious about all of this. Possibly, yeah. That's a much more positive look than I have on it. <laughs> I'm like, what good are thoughts? Okay, they don't do anything. They'll stay inside of me. Good vibes. I don't even know what good vibes means. It's good vibration. You've got to align yourself with the resonant frequency of the earth. <laughs> Have the vibrations come out to you. Again, it's a, it's a weird underneath. I, I'm happy to pray for you. God, the scripture teaches us prayer is super effective, but of the three, that's the only one that does something mm -hmm. is, is prayer. Yeah. Um, where else? There's a another another practice that's similar to New Age, but it's kind of a, an offset of it called Wicca. 
Are you familiar if you read the word Wicca I've before? I've heard the term, but does, does that have to do with witches? Yeah, the modern witches. Um, and warlocks or wizards, I'm not sure what they call them. But, uh, but Wicca is uh, unashamed, un unashamed to be neo-pagan. Um, to be a new, new anti-Christian thing. Uh, where they intentionally pray to, to the goddess, the earth goddess, um, to get their, their magical powers from, and then they, they will cast spells, actually cast spells on people. Um, there are all kinds of things, good spells and bad spells. None of which work. No. Things for like, that you would fall in love, or that you would get a job, or death to your enemies, like all kinds of spells that can be cast. And a large part um, comes in the fact that there's this Reiki practice of, of smudging, uh, where you get your, your sage and you put on a stick and you go wave it around your house to try to scare the demons away, uh, or whatever else it is. Uh, I was reading a book, um, a book that really opened up my eyes to this whole issue of American paganism. It's called, by H, by, by Bennett, uh, forget his first name, um, where he goes through these, these pagan practices in the United States. And he talks about specifically voodoo, going down to the, into the deep south, New Orleans, and experiencing actual voodoo. Um, and then he talks about um, smudging, specifically. He gives a story of this, this Christian couple. They were retired. They were traveling in retirement. They went down to Arizona. And they were doing their thing in Arizona. Snowbirding, I think, mm -hmm. is the, the proper term. And they went and they visited this um, Native American center to learn about the Native Americans. And while they were there, a, a Native American shaman came out and was going to introduce them, you know, this is how the Native Americans did things. And so he gave everybody a piece of sage and another fire, said some things, and everybody threw the sage on the fire, uh, this, this couple included. Um, well, he just participated in a worshiping ancestors, right? a false religion, a pagan thing. Um, and it's so easy to get sucked into something like that, thinking, oh, I'm just going to learn about it or whatever, I'm just going to witness it, um, and then without realizing it, you are participating in, in these practices. Can you witness without participating? In other words, not necessarily throwing the sage of the fire, but just kind of standing back and watching? Learning things? Probably, yeah. Um, I'm sure you, you can it's, You can certainly learn about false practices, um, but we got to be careful that we, if we're learning about these false practices, that we don't start practicing the false practices. Um, same thing goes with voodoo. Um, there's, if you went on the, um, I think of New Orleans as, as a place where voodoo is, voodoo sure. is practiced. There was that one movie, just the movie, um, the Frog Princess movie, where the bad guy was a voodoo doctor. I don't think I've seen it. Okay, it's a relatively new Disney movie. Uh, but the bad guy is a voodoo witch doctor kind of guy, but it's, it's an actual thing. I'm surprised Disney would make such a movie. It wasn't a very good movie. It has a number of failings to it, um, but it but it is it's a uh, it's something that that when when tourists go down to New Orleans they go down and they look for these voodoo places because that's the thing to go do. Well, probably shouldn't go and do that. Um, that would be that would be a poor practice. Okay, where are we? All right, any questions so far? Great. Most of us are here from last week. Um, so then, so then, uh, neo paganism, um, the, the whole, I had to summarize it, is worshiping the creation instead of the creator. And so you're looking to the stuff that's made um, instead of the one who made it. Uh, this is the most basic form of idolatry, where you build a statue, then you worship the statue that you build. Uh, and it's like, whether it's with Wicca, worship, with worshiping the earth, and so now we're, we're worshiping the earth rather than God who created the earth. Um, or with, um, I don't know, an, an, where you worship the energy of the universe uh, rather than worshiping God. Um, yeah, cool. Um, so neopaganism then, it sees nature as pure and humans as a curse upon it. Um, and so the idea is to escape or transcend humanity, to transcend the world, to transcend creation. Um, and so humans are kind of messing everything up and so we've got to escape it. And how do we do that? By becoming one with the universe. Um, by either reincarnating ourselves out of it, by being more pious and getting out of it. Um, that way we can escape 
um, this, this, which is the exact opposite of Christianity. Where in Christianity we learned that, that yes, creation is corrupt, but humans were intentionally put here to take care of it. Um, are we doing a bad job? Yeah, I, you can make the case at times that we are. Um, they're definitely not. We're definitely not perfect in how we're managing the earth. Uh, things like pollution in the ocean, that kind of stuff. Um, but humans aren't a plague upon the earth. The earth was created for humans to be on. Um, and so it is a direct opposite um, of what God's plans were. And in fact, God is going to remake the world. We're going to get a new creation, um, a new world, um, one without, without sin. Yeah, okay. Great. Your thoughts, questions, comments, concerns? I wonder if we have any from the internet. Well, on the internet, if you have any questions, um, go ahead and just type them in the comments. And we can, yeah, no, no comments here. And then we'll, we'll answer them. Okay. Moving right along then. Superstitions. Uh, superstitions are probably one of the most common forms of paganism that people don't realize are paganism. Uh, and I just have here a list of, of common superstitions. Uh, before we get to my list, do you, do you have any superstitions that you hang on to? My mother did. She was very superstitious. Well, we sold all the silver that did not go to the shaker. Yeah. Um, that's about the only one that I, I can think of that's not on here. Sure. Um, I think walking, was it stepping on cracks in the sidewalk? You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> step, with, how, how, step on the crack, break the mag. Yeah. I remember that one as a kid. Um, but um, you said more religious than you think? Yeah. Okay. Go. <laughs> 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 I'm interested in hearing this. Yeah, so the history of superstitions is a lot of fun. Um, if you ever have time to research it. And the internet is a great place to find all information. And so this comes from the internet. How do you know what to believe on the internet, though? You guys, you gotta, so you, you, you go ahead and track on sources, and so it's not just, like you watch this, you know, like on YouTube, 10 superstitions have history didn't know about. Uh, no, you gotta find people who wrote down the books, and you gotta find the books, and you gotta read the sources of the books, okay. and, and trace it back. Otherwise, you're gonna get some, somebody's opinion of something. My favorite one is Friday the 13th, and when people don't understand the history of Friday the 13th, I can know that they have done exactly no research into trying to figure it out. Uh, Friday the 13th has the greatest documented history of why it's a superstition out of any of them. Um, so before I tell you why Friday the 13th is a bad day, do you have any ideas why Friday the 13th is a bad day? Um, just throwing it out there that uh, Easter might have fallen or no. Uh, Good Friday might have fallen on Friday the 13th at some point. Yeah, that's a, that's a common common thought. Um, it's a good thought. It's a good bias thought. That's not the answer. Any other, any other ideas? No. No? Okay. Great. Thanks for playing. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get a prize though, right? Uh, you can, I can throw a pencil at you. <laughs> no, so I was, I, was, I was trying to figure it out, and I found this article that was published in a bunch of newspapers. It was just the same article, just reprinted all over. And all of them said that the number 13 was unlucky because there were 13 people at the Last Supper and Judas Iscariot was the 13th one there. And so that's why that number was unlucky. And the Last Supper occurred on a Friday. And so that's why Friday the 13th is unlucky. But wait, you say, that's a problem because the Last Supper occurred on a Thursday. So that's how you can tell they did exactly no research into it. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> um, yeah. But I mean, just it, it seems like, I mean, even now, skyscrapers don't have a 13th, a 13th floor. floor. Yep. Like, people, what is it with the number 13? Triskaidekaphobia is what it's called. It's the, that's the fear of the number 13. Yeah, it gets back to the Templars. The Knights Templar uh, is, is where this comes from. So the Knights Templar were uh, um, the 
leaders were rounded up and executed by the King of France on Friday the 13th. Um, the Templars had gotten so much power, uh, so the Templar Knights were uh, essentially bodyguards for hire. If you were a pilgrim going down to the Holy Land, um, you could pay them, pay them, and they'd protect you, kind of thing. Um, and they were started out being super pious, then um, with all of this uh, transporting back and forth in the Holy Land, they became like bankers. They acquired a bunch of wealth, and the Templar Knights had a whole bunch of wealth. Um, and then with wealth comes power, and they had a lot of political power and sway over the Pope and that kind of thing. So the Pope came up, teamed up with the King of France, and then on Friday the 13th, they rounded up all of the leaders of the Templar Knights, executed them, and disbanded the order. And since that day, Friday the 13th has been an unlucky day. It's hard to see why. <laughs> yeah. So that's the history of Friday the 13th. That's not particularly pagan, uh, but that's where the, the thing comes from. Why? Very interesting. Yeah. So, um, some of them, some practices that we do, uh, some superstitions are just kind of fun, silly things. Others are actual pagan practices that have just survived for a crazy long time, um, and we still have, have walking around. Um, for example, finding the four leaf clover. Why is that a lucky thing? They're rare. Um, yeah, so one superstition for the four-day clovers is that when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, Eve took a four-day clover with her. Um, and that's why four-day clovers are lucky, because they are remnants of the Garden of Eden. I don't believe that one. <laughs> Uh, another one is just because they're rare, and finding it means that you have good luck because you found them because it's rare. Um, that's the one that I tend to, to lean toward, rather than adding the religious significance to it. Um, but any of these would have to do with luck, just, just luck in general. Um, luck is a superstition, and, and luck comes from the seven gods of fortune. Okay. Yep, okay. Greek. It's a Greek thing, goes back to the, to the Greeks, uh, and so there are seven gods of fortune. So why is seven a lucky number? God. The seven gods of fortune. Uh, and so if the gods of fortune smiled upon you, you had good luck, uh, or good fortune, as it's sometimes called. And so all of these things of, of finding good luck and finding good fortune and asking for luck come from beseeching the seven gods of fortune. And they manifested themselves in different ways. And so there's lots of different ways that finding good luck or having good luck has come out from the blessings of the seven gods of fortune. Uh, one of them, finding a penny. Face up. Face up, specifically. I don't know why that, that, I couldn't find history on why it has to be face up instead of face down. I looked. I really looked. Uh, one of the things my wife and I do is we find a penny. We've added a new rule. Um, that the first is if you find it that's face down, you have to flip it over. Um, that way the next person stumbling across it will find it face up. And so one of us will find it face down and flip it over, then the other one will find it and pick it up. Uh, and that's how we get by that one. My own personal life. Uh, <laughs> Does it uh, make you superstitious? No, it makes me goofy. <laughs> um, the only thing I can do for finding a penny, again, except for fortune smiling upon you, the gods of fortune smiling upon you, um, has to do with finding metal. Uh, being able to determine where metal was was a very lucrative business back in the ancient world and still is today to some extent. If you found a gold mine in your back house, backyard, that'd be pretty nice. Be rich. Yeah, you'd, you'd, you'd say that you were very lucky. Uh, and, and so finding a penny would be a gift of metal from the gods um, is, is the loosest connection that I can find uh, where, where that one comes from. Um, but again, this idea of, of luck in general is it's asking the gods of fortune to, to help you. Um, does the Bible talk about luck? Yeah. No, luck's not a thing. Um, and, and so when we start asking for luck or looking for luck or trying to find luck, we're asking them that's just not in creation. Um, there's, there's no law of luck or attribute of luck that's in there. Isn't that kind of like a, a false god? Yeah, yeah, and so it, it takes worshiping the stuff instead of worshiping the god. We're making this idol of luck, or, you know, Vegas lady luck, whoever, whoever she is. Um, that we're asking, instead of asking God for 
for blessing, we're seeking out this other avenue of trying to ask for blessing. Biblical authors saw unexpected blessings as that, and that's how they phrased it, as unexpected blessings. They didn't use the word luck. In the Old Testament, in the, in the sacrificial laws given to Moses, there's a whole bunch of things given out of when you're supposed to offer sacrifices. We're familiar with the big ones, things like Passover, when you sacrifice the lamb, on the Day of Atonement, when you sacrifice the goat, uh, and, and so many more things. There's grain offerings, and fruit offerings, and sin offerings. But there's another category of offerings called thank offerings. And in thank offerings, these are when you give um, thanks to God for the blessings that he's given to you. And there's a whole host of categories of thank offerings. You know, thank you for, for a child. Um, so Jesus goes to the temple to be circumcised and then to, to offer the appropriate offerings. Or Mary and Joseph are giving the thank offerings for having a baby, um, for, for getting a house, for whatever it is. When good things happen to you, you give thanks to God. And the thank offerings focus us to give thanks to God. And there are specific, there's a specific offering listed in there. Um, I didn't write down the reference, but it's there. <laughs> Um, for unexpected blessings. Um, and so where God blesses you unexpectedly, you are go to the temple and offer, a offer an offering um, for God giving this unexpected blessing. Uh, we tend to call that luck. So if you're lucky and you win the lottery or whatever it is, uh, it's an unexpected blessing. And so it's better for us as Christians then to stop playing around with the idea of luck where we're giving thanks to stuff, to chance, to probability, to the energy of the universe for providing me with these things if we're new age, to instead say, thank you God for this unexpected blessing. Um, recognizing that all blessings come from God and God alone, not from some impersonal Star wars -y force of luck, but from God and God alone. And so when we try to engage in these totems, which like a rabbit's foot, or the four-leaf clover, or wearing the same orange camouflage shirt um, all the time when you go hunting because it's brought in you luck every year for the last 20 years. Where did the um, idea of a, a rabbit's foot eating lucky ever come from? I mean, it wasn't lucky for the rabbit. So, <laughs> true fact. Um, as far as I was able to, again, internet searching, it's a fertility thing, being blessed with kids. Because rabbits reproduce like rabbits. And having a rabbit's foot would help you, would give you the blessing of more kids, which would be a lucky thing. And so I got associated with that. And knocking on wood. Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, we're almost there. We'll come to that one in a minute. Okay. But again, uh, so luck is is trying to, to to give thanks for something other than God for blessings, uh, rather than seeing blessings coming from God. Um, like horseshoes, you got to put the horseshoe up the right way so the luck doesn't fall out. Familiar with this one? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Because again, blessings coming from the horseshoe rather than God. Well, the horseshoe one has more nuance to it, which we'll talk about when we talk about black cats. Uh, but knocking on wood. Um, so where did that come from? Any any idea? Not got a, it has to do with spirits again. Um, yeah, so there was this uh, superstition. Uh, that naming something will will prevent it from happening. And the reason being is that you are now alerting the presence of spirits, what your intentions are, and the spirits are going to try to thwart you. Uh, and so uh, the evil spirits, or whatever it is. And so this is, again, it's a pagan practice um, where spirits dwell in, in a lot of different things, and there's bad spirits and good spirits, depending on where they are. Um, and one of the good places that spirits live is in trees. Uh, the spirits of the forest and that kind of stuff. And so when you would encounter, say in a plan that you wanted to happen, you, you knew that the bad spirits are now alerted to your intentions, you would knock on wood because you wanted to awaken the good spirits who were in the tree to prevent the bad spirits from doing things to you. And so you're trying to get the attention of a good spirit to protect you and your plans until your plans come to fruition, rather than talking to a bad spirit who overheard your plans and is now trying to prevent them from taking place. And people actually believe this part. Yep, sometimes they use the word fairies instead of spirits, um, like the, you know, wake up the fairies, like the Tinkerbell kind of thing. Um, or twig. Yeah, yeah, and so it's uh, knocking on wood is to awaken the good spirits, the way they keep away the bad spirits so your plans can happen. Now, specifically, the Apostle Paul talks about talking about your plans. Only Paul brings it up in, in a different term. 
He wants us to, instead of saying that I plan to do this, or it's my intention to go to, to, go to Thebes or whatever it is, he says, um, use the phrase, if the Lord be willing. So instead of knocking on wood, going around doing these things, and he's like, you don't know what's going to happen in the future. You don't know about tomorrow. It's not promised to you. Ten, ten minutes from now is not promised to you. And so if you're making plans for the future, keep God in mind. God is the one who ordains things and allows things to take place. Uh, as, as a pastor that I had growing up, I would say, one day God's going to whistle and you're going to come home. And you don't know when God's going to whistle. Uh, and so Paul would say, use the phrase, if the Lord's willing. Um, and so I'm going to go visit, I'm going to go on a vacation this summer, if the Lord's willing. I'm going to go and do this. Um, my dad used to say, if the Lord's willing, I'm going to pick up rice. Um, that was his, his phrase that he just spouted mm -hmm. out. Um, but again, it's, it's that instead of knocking on wood to get the spirits to make sure that the bad spirits don't thwart you, uh, the appropriate way Christians react to this is to say, you know, I'm going to go and do this, Lord be willing. Um, genuinely asking that God would allow us or, or will that this would take place. I can hear a lot of people saying, God willing. Yeah, God willing, Lord willing, those kinds of things. Which is the appropriate and healthy way to talk about it rather than wake up spirits. That's just, no. I have always, this one is always like, the more I think about it, the more it makes me chuckle. If this is a spirit that's going to protect things, it did a pretty bad job. That tree got cut down to make whatever it is that I'm trying to wake up. <laughs> <laughs> Spirit died in the kill where the wood dried. Okay, um, so horseshoes then. Horseshoes come from, um, again, the idea of witches. And so witches were thought to be able to transform themselves into black cats. That's where the black cats come from. Um, so like vampires became bats and witches became black cats. What's up? Just so you know, I'm going to be your cat player. Okay, have fun. Um, these are my cats that I'm going to play. Okay, cool. Enjoy the outside. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, nice. Come on, speed up. Anyway, yeah, so, uh, and cats are afraid of horses, apparently, or so it was thought. I don't know if that's true. I've never owned either, and I can't tell you. But the horseshoes then uh, were signs that a horse was nearby and would keep the cats away. And so you would hang horseshoes around because you wanted to keep the witches out. And so that's where that practice of hanging horseshoes comes from. And so it's good luck not have a witch nearby, which is where that, that, practice, that practice comes from. Uh, walking under a ladder, um, there's been some attempts to make that into a, a religious thing. Like a ladder has three points, like a top and two sides, like the Trinity. We and have a ladder leaning up against the building. Again, three points. Uh, oh, yeah, the three is associated with the Trinity, and you don't want to disrupt the Trinity. But I'm like, I feel like you're stretching. I'm pretty sure it's more of just things would fall on you. Yes. And you don't want things to fall on you, so avoid walking under ladders. Um, that's as far as I can find with that one. Uh, breaking a mirror. Uh, this comes from uh, Greek philosophy and having the idea of, of the soul um, and, and, and different realms. And uh, it was thought that uh, mirrors captured part of your soul. Um, and so breaking the mirror would be bad because it would trap your soul inside of it. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Yeah, so how does the guy get in the mirror? You don't want to be trapped inside the mirror. So there was this, uh, this you know, breaking the mirror is bad luck because part of your soul gets trapped inside the mirror. Okay, but my next question is, is cursed for all eternity, so he must have broken two other mirrors in the airport. It's unfortunate. Unfortunate? <laughs> Very unfortunate and messy. Yeah, that's a big mess. Yeah, so uh, mirrors, um, that's where that comes from, is that uh, when, when you're looking back at yourself, you're seeing your soul, and, and, and your soul is trapped inside, and so to break that is to break part of your soul, which would be bad. Um, you want to, want to avoid that kind of thing. Um, and I don't know what the seven years of bad luck got tacked on there somehow. I don't know where that came from. Uh, but it's, again, it's this idea of trapping your soul. In, in modern times, uh, some would say that um, pictures have become the new mirrors, where pictures take part of your soul. Um, what's up, buddy? I'm teaching Bible study. You have to go to somewhere else. Go play a toilet about. 
Okay, you can stand, we have to be quiet though. We're having Bible study still. Yeah, so that's where breaking the air comes from. Black cats, because <laughs> they used to be witches. Yeah, some people thought some people thought that Native Americans would capture part of not Native Americans that pictures would capture part of your soul. Same kind of thing with mirrors. Um, the same idea that because you can see yourself, you're seeing part of your soul, and so if you broke it, it would be it would be bad luck. Um, I'm glad you. Bought, I've heard the Native Americans thing before as well, um, but I think there was a big superstition with just in general across the. Uh, Across the board, when cameras were specifically new, because um, people didn't know the technology that was there, like where does this come from? How does this? How does this seem? Uh, but yeah, for sure, absolutely. Cool. Um, what else do we have? Breaking a mirror. Talked about black cats. Talking about finding the penny. Talked about break or, a leg. Break a leg. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I always said good luck. <laughs> so when you're an actor and you're going on stage, you're never told good luck. You're always told, break a, leg. break a leg. Why are you told to break a leg on stage? What? Why are you told to break a leg on stage? superstitions today and I was I'm like still gonna probably tell people to break legs today. Break legs? <laughs> Just say I don't break your leg. Only in the context of theater. <laughs> yeah, so there's actually a whole bunch of superstitions around acting. And a lot of it coming out of Greek mythology. Really? Yeah. Daddy! 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 I mean all I know is Papa, Papa. Okay, get back up. Go my mommy, go talk to Papa. Um, some of them, some of the superstitions I found for uh, for actors involve um, pregnancy, and it's unlucky to be pregnant while you're acting. Well, I've done that. It was just crappy. <laughs> no, um, trying trying to trying to act and dance and sing while pregnant was a very unlucky experience. Was it unlucky to No, 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 no. No, it's Joseph. That was Joseph. Joseph. I, I was one of the wives, and like there's there's one time near the end of that that I was so completely exhausted after um, like we were in the final week of rehearsals for you mm -hmm. doing really all the time. I literally started crying and I went up to Merit and I said, Merit, I have to go home. And Merit was like, go home. <laughs> I was like, it's just I'm not gonna get any better. I'm just gonna sit here and I'm just gonna cry because I'm a very, very tired pregnant lady. <laughs> yeah. And, and for some reason, your hormones kick in high gear when you're pregnant, and you're, you're just exhausted. Just <laughs> Aya, come on, let's go. Yeah, but well actually, is exactly right for the the history of break a leg because you don't want to wish good luck again because the spirits would hear you and then try to thwart you. That's how it is. Yeah. This is funny. Carp is actually calling. Oh. He's probably watching the Bible study. <laughs> like, oh <my> <laughs> uh, thank you, Papa. <laughs> now, is Papa you, yours or uh, mine? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's another one. Um, we talked about Friday the 13th. And then we have the, the next one is wear the same pair of socks so your sports team doesn't lose or whatever piece of garment you're on. So this is my lucky hat. Every time I wore it, you know, the, the Chicago Cubs went to the World Series. So every time I wear this hat, the Cubs are gonna go to the World Series. Um, again, it's this idea of trying to appease the spirits, um, that the spirits have, have made this happen. Um, and that if I can attract their attention in the same way, then they will reward me the same. Um, it's this, with this religious experience. Uh, blowing out birthday candles. I've never heard that as a superstition before. I thought it was just make a, a wish. Tradition. Papa. Yeah. So, where did the hit? Why, why do we put candles on birthday cakes? Tradition. Tradition. <laughs> yeah, it's Papa. Go show mommy. Go show mommy. 
I tried to track this one down, um, the history of candles on birthday cakes, and I found a tradition of worshiping the goddess Venus, um, and I'm not sure how much how, how true this one is. Well, really? Isn't she the goddess of love? Yeah. Uh, so the planet Venus, right, you can see it in the, in the skies, it wanders around, and it's a very bright star, and so you put the uh, candles on the birthday cake to try to stimulate that and get Venus's attention, and then, so then blowing the candles out. Um, would be a way of getting Venus's attention to bless you with love. Oh, so like if you have one candle left for your birthday cake, means that you're gonna have one boyfriend in the next year. Yeah, that's kind of actually related. That's a, that's 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 where the, they scholars think that the scholars I found anyway think that it comes from. That's uh, so funny. That's try, interesting. Trying to get Venus's attention. I don't know how true that is. That one sounds made up to me. That one sounds pretty made up to me too. It seems like a big stretch, but that's what I found. But yeah, again, blowing out your candles asking for fortune. You're not asking God for blessings. You're asking somebody else for blessing. Might as well be Venus. Um, it's this idea that instead of giving thanks to God for unexpected your blessings, we're now thanking that we blew out the candles on time, and that's how we got those blessings. For a telling and set to the baby by holding a needle extending from a string. I'm not familiar with them. That's definitely a superstition. I've heard it with a ring, not a needle. Um, and I'm dating myself. So there was an episode of All in the Family, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, where Gloria was pregnant and somebody came in with a ring dangling from a string so that they could determine whether or not it was a boy or a girl. Yeah, that would be a practice of divination. So that would be more than a superstition, that would be actually like uh, trying to tap into the auras. Um, so that would, because the baby has its aura too, and so that aura is going to be pushing a mom's aura in a different way. And if the auras align and go one way, to in line with somewhere else. That would be my guess. It would be a divination practice. That feels more like witchcraft than it does like a superstition yeah. to me. Uh, either way, it would probably be avoided. Uh, let's, let's not do that one. Um, is that from a comment? Somebody, somebody's read that one in? Yeah. Okay. Um, another one that I've heard of is holding your breath when you drive past a cemetery. Really? Yeah, have you not, not heard of that one? Oh, uh, what's that? I used to walk through cemeteries. Yeah, this is this was this was one that I knew growing up, um, and it's not unpopular. Is that uh, evil spirits dwell in cemeteries? It's just a place where they like to hang out, a place of death or whatever. Um, and so when you walk past or drive past the cemetery, you got to hold your breath. That way, the evil spirits don't enter into you. That's actually one I've never heard of before. Is it, it's it's similar to saying "bless you" when you sneeze. When your heart stops. When you sneeze, doesn't it? That one. So uh, the "bless you" one comes from the uh, that when you're sneezing, you're giving up your spirit, and you want to make sure that a good spirit, your your good spirit comes back, and not a bad spirit comes in. And so you say "bless you" when you sneeze. That way, uh, good spirits come in, and not bad spirits. Um, okay. The superstition. Don't walk on top of a grave. Yep. That is yep. coming in as a message. Yep. Uh, don't walk on a grave. That'd be another one. Similar kind of thing. You don't want to, to get haunted by a dead spirit. Um, and so what does the Bible teach us about the dead? When you're dead, you stay dead. When you die once, there comes judgment. And so people who are in heaven stay in heaven, and people who are in hell stay in hell, with few exceptions. Um, if God wants to send somebody back, he can, but it's not going to happen walking on a grave. Now, uh, there's the example of Samuel in, uh, I want to say it's 1 Samuel, but it might be 2 Samuel. I'm pretty sure it's 1 Samuel, where the witch of Endor um, conjures up Samuel's spirit. Um, and Samuel comes, so King Saul's running for his life. God's not talking to him, so he goes and he finds this, this medium or this witch to bring back his spirit so he can ascertain the truth from God. So he's like, let me talk to Samuel. He was God's prophet. He had my back. So he talked to Samuel. So he finds this witch. He says, I want to talk to the prophet Samuel. The spirit of Samuel comes back, whatever that means. Um, and then the spirit's very angry. Samuel's like, dude, what are you doing? You know better than this. You're not supposed to do this. I'm not going to give you any advice. And in fact, you're going to die tomorrow. Um, it's kind of a very sad message for not just you, but all of your family. Um, and so Saul leaves dejected. Um, and then he and his family die the next day. And so 
conjuring up spirits is a bad thing, no matter who you are, what you're trying to do. God's not pro. Don't, don't do this. He's not for it. Um, but, yeah, it's one of the weird stories in the Bible. Uh, there's any other superstitions that you are aware of? These are just, just a, there's a throwing salt over your shoulder. That's like you spill salt to pick it up and throw it over your shoulder. I think you even mentioned that earlier. I mentioned it earlier, but I had no idea what relevance it had. There's a couple. Uh, one is that it's valuable. Um, that salt is such a valuable thing. It was unlucky to spill it. So if you hear the phrase, worth your salt, worth it, um, yeah. that's because salt is so valuable that people used to get paid in salt. Okay. Another, another one is, is you spilled the salt because the devil was there next to you, but again, because salt's valuable, so you pick it up and you throw it over your shoulder. You always over your left shoulder, because then it hits the devil over the eye. And so the idea is that you're fending off the devil who made you spill the salt because salt's valuable, and then you try and keep him out, so you throw the salt over your shoulder and he gets him in the eye. Like we've seen, every, like every cartoon that you ever watched has the two like angel and mm -hmm. guy that, that show up. Can this happen today, the spirit thing? Which, which spirit thing? There's a lot of spirit things. Which spirit thing? The Samuel spirit thing? I'm guessing it's... Type in the comments below so we can Type in your comments below so we can see what's going on. Oh, there will be a delay here. Uh, I'm going to keep talking about salt while you type your comment in. Um, yeah, and so uh, there's the, the two angels, you know, the, the, your conscience mm -hmm. and your other guy. And Angel so you, and devil, yeah. yeah, so you're throwing the salt at the other guy to try and scare him off. Yes, yeah, 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 the Samuel, Samuel thing. thing. Yeah. Okay. So we don't know. Um, but it's a big maybe. Um, and it's not something we're going to go researching uh, because God specifically forbids us from doing it. And so we're not going to. Uh, whether or not, there's, there's, there's all kinds of stories about people encountering spirits. Um, and people are allowed to have their experiences, and I'm not going to take them away. Um, stories from like um, a woman who was married for a long time, um, and then she was struggling with infertility. She and her son, she and her husband finally have a baby, and they have the baby. And then shortly after having the baby, her husband and their child both die in a car crash. And now she's left alone all again. It's a super tragic situation, but situations like that do happen, and she is just struck by grief. And so. Every night for a week, um, when she goes to bed, there at the foot of her bed is her husband holding the baby. Um, and they talk for a while. Um, and the husband says, it's OK. I'm up here in heaven. The baby's up here in heaven. And they're able to have that. And Spirit says, God, let's, God says, I can only, can only do this for a couple more days. Uh, something like that. Did that event actually take place? Could have. Could have. Uh, we don't know, um, but the person would say had this experience, um, and could it just be this person being so grief is hallucinating? You know, maybe. We don't know, um, and so, but we're not going to go and investigate it. Uh, that's not not what we're what we're supposed to do. Um, going and seeing going and seeing mediums and psychics and and, and those kinds of things, you're going to run into one of two problems. Uh, one, their faith, which is the most common situation and they're just going to swindle you out of your money. Um, there's a whole science to being a fake psychic that you can get uh, a part of. There's actually a challenge out there by a guy who's offering a million dollars to anybody who can prove that they're a real psychic. Um, and it's, I'll, I'll talk about that next time we meet. I'll, I'll find a video and I'll share it with you. It's, it's a lot of fun to watch. Um, if he disproves that whole um, psychic thing. Um, but the second chance is you find you know, the one in a million who's a real psychic. Um, and by that I mean they have, they're interacting with dark spirits. And you want to avoid them too. Uh, you don't want to be interacting with dark spirits. Um, as we saw last week, and Milford read through the, the chapter in Acts, uh, where there was this fortune teller who was possessed by a demon who was making a bunch of money. Then the apostles cast the demon out, and so they throw the apostle into jail uh, because he took away his, his, his source of income. Um, and so there is this... There, Demons are real. Demons possess people. Um, and so you're either going to find the, the one who's going to swindle you, or you're going to find the one who's possessed. And either way, you want to avoid that situation. Um, so yeah, could have happened. I'm going to say probably not. But I'm not going to go and try to prove myself wrong. Um, nor should you. 
stay away from those kinds of things. <laughs> like the danger of talking about this is, is people are gonna get curious and be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go figure this out. I'm gonna go find it. And you know, I'm gonna go down to my local street corner to the sign that says palm readings and, and figure it out. Well, what you're trying to do is you're trying to, to, it's like, if I can prove that demons are real, then I can prove that God is real. If I prove that spirit's real, then I know that God's real. It's a twisted sense of logic. Um, you shouldn't be going to demons to try to prove that God's real. It just it sounds dumb when you say it out loud. Um, so don't do it. Um, there's absolutely no reason to go and search out a psychic or a medium. Um, there's no reason to. Well, you just said, <coughs> isn't it fair to say that if you believe that demons exist, that God exists? Yeah. We live in a, so, <laughs> uh, how does Jesus say it? A faithless generation demands signs, and we live in an age where people are demanding signs. Like, prove to me God's real. Give me a sign that God's real. Look around. Right, and so people are looking for a sign that God's real, and so they're going to go and they're going to look in bad places to try to find that God's real, um, wherever that place may be. And they're going to go and try to find it. Because um, they're like, they need, they want to have that extra assurance of faith that if I know that this is real, like, okay, so I went and I saw this, this person possessed by a demon, so now I know. Now I know without a doubt that God's real because I saw a demon. The Bible talks about demons. Now I know that God's real. It's twisted logic. Um, let's, not, let's, let's not seek it out. Um, yeah. Yeah. Great. Hope that answers your question. Uh, probably more information than you wanted. Uh, so can it happen? Probably not. Don't go look. Okay. Got a couple minutes left. Any other students wishing? We're about to lose the camera. Um, we're doing pretty well. I'm just going on for Bible study. We've got just a couple minutes left here. Uh, so the camera cuts out. I apologize. Um, but yeah, thank you for joining us. Um, there was another superstition I wanted to talk about.